How's it going everybody? Daner here with North Central Coins and welcome back to another exciting episode of the most rare and valuable coins in Canada. Today we're going to be taking a look at 10 super rare Canadian dimes that you have a good chance of finding or might be sitting in your change jars or collections right now and if identified correctly can make you some insane amounts of money. Every single one of the coins that we discussed today, although rare, is not impossible to find and in this video we will explore each of these valuable pieces of currency and delve into why they hold such incredible value in Canadian numismatics. Additionally, we will discuss any distinguishing and identifying features, their significance among collectors and also the potential value if you happen to own or find a legitimate example. Before I do get into this, I would really appreciate if you guys would smash that thumbs up, subscribe if you're new, and also ring that bell notification so you can follow along with my new content as it is being released. And make sure to stay to the end of the video if you'd like to find out which is the most rare and valuable Canadian dime that you can find in your pocket change. And then without any further ado, what do you say we get right into it and take a look at 10 rare Canadian dimes that you can find. Let's get it, guys. In the realm of early Canadian Queen Elizabeth II coins, collectors recognize two distinct obverse varieties, known as the shoulder fold and the no shoulder fold. The distinguishing feature within these varieties lies in the last eye in the DEI on the obverse. In the shoulder fold variety, the eye appears straight and blunt, while in the no shoulder fold variety, the eye exhibits serifs that flare out at the end. This subtle difference serves as a key differentiator for enthusiasts and collectors alike. Now the value of these shoulder fold and no shoulder fold coins can be influenced by various factors, including the date, the denomination, and the overall rarity and the specific variety. In the case of the 1953 Canadian dime, the presence of the no shoulder fold variety may add to its desirability among collectors if you can identify a rare error. Usually when examining the 1953 Canadian dime, collectors tend to seek out the shoulder fold variety. Both the shoulder fold and no shoulder fold 1953 dimes share a mintage figure and for some reason the shoulder fold is the more desirable of the two if you can't identify any errors or varieties but little known to most there is actually an error for the no shoulder fold that can make it more valuable than any of the other variations. Now let's briefly go over die deterioration doubling or DDD on Canadian coins. Die deterioration doubling on Canadian coins is a result of wear and fatigue on the coin die used in the minting process. This phenomenon occasionally leads to doubling, where the design elements appear duplicated or three-dimensional. Unlike intentional double dies, which are caused by a mistake in the engraving process, die deterioration doubling is a more common error resulting from the natural deterioration of the coin die over time. There are several characteristics that can distinguish die deterioration doubling. Firstly, the surface of the doubling is rough and may vary in definition, often featuring different widths and rounded contours. This doubling typically indicates in one or a few specific locations on the die and then gradually spreads, encompassing larger portions of the design as the die continues to degrade. One notable aspect of die deterioration doubling is its potential to completely surround parts of the design, such as numbers and letters. This can give the affected areas a distinct and irregular appearance, making the doubling easily identifiable under close inspection. Die deterioration can also manifest in other ways, leaving additional marks on the coins, such as trails or lines. These marks are often indicative of the wear and tear on the die and contribute to the overall uniqueness of the coins affected by die deterioration doubling. In comparison to other forms of doubling, die deterioration doubling is considered less rare and sought after by collectors. While collectors may find the distinctive characteristics of die deterioration doubling interesting, they generally do not command the same premium as coins with more prominent errors such as doubled dies. It's also very important to note that die deterioration doubling is typically not a major factor in determining the value of a coin. There are rare instances where it can affect critical elements like the date 
and it might contribute slightly to the coin's value. However, these cases are infrequent, and for the most part, coins affected with dye deterioration doubling are valued similarly to the regular coins. But there are some cases where collectors often appreciate these coins for their unique features, but the market value, unfortunately, for these dye deterioration doubling coins is not as significant as the market for more pronounced minting errors. Now, in the case of the 1953 Canadian dime, usually the shoulder fold would be the more valuable without any noticeable errors. But if you want to find the most valuable version of the coins, you are actually looking for the no shoulder fold, and you actually want to identify doubling on the date on the reverse of the coin. Now, once again, to identify the no shoulder fold, you want to flip over to the obverse and take a look at the last I in DEI and you want the serifs at the end of the eye to flare out as opposed to the shoulder fold which would appear straight and blunt. Now you also want to identify doubling on the date of the coin so flip over to the reverse and closely examine the date. Now if the date appears to show signs of doubling which may make it appear more three-dimensional in appearance then you may have this rare error or variety. Some of the details and specifications for the 1953 Canadian dime, if any of these are off, it may indicate that it is not authentic. The overall mintage for the Canadian 1953 dime is 17,706,395, and that includes both the no shoulder fold and the shoulder fold varieties. Now the specifications for this coin, it is composed of 80% silver, 20% copper, it has a weight of 2.33 grams. It has a diameter of 18.03 millimeters, a thickness of 1.16 millimeters. The coin was designed and engraved by Mary Gillick and Thomas Shingles for the obverse and Emmanuel Hahn for the reverse. The edge is reeded, it is non-magnetic, and it has a diaxis and metal alignment as is the standard for most Canadian, British, and Australian coins. Now in terms of the value for the Canadian 1953 no shoulder fold with the double date. Now to get the highest premium for this coin, you want to identify doubling on all of the digits for the date. The values for this coin are only listed if it has the entire date attributed with doubling. So first of all, just to give you guys a comparison, there are no low end values for the 1953 no shoulder fold with doubling on the date. But just to give you guys an idea, in comparison, the regular no shoulder fold is worth around $2 for an AG3. And in the case of this coin, it will just about double the value on the low end. So you may be able to get around $4 or $5 at the very bottom of the Sheldon scale. And it's probably worth anywhere from $10 to $15 for an AU50 if you can get the no shoulder fold and the double 1953. Now, as we start to get into the high end, the 1953 shoulder fold variety is worth around $882 for an MS66 example. Now the highest listed value for the 1953 no shoulder fold with the doubling on the date of 1953 is $80 for an MS64. But if you consider that the shoulder fold is only worth around $35 at that same grading tier, then if we extrapolate that upwards, I would say that the 1953 no shoulder fold with the doubling on the date can be worth anywhere from a couple thousand to $10,000 if it gets the high MS66 or MS67 attribution. So this would actually be a great coin for collectors that might already have some 1953 Canadian dimes in their collection, especially if they are in good condition, if they are graded in an ICCS holder, I would pull out your microscope and take another look at that date. If you have one and it's in a PCGS holder, they may not actually attribute the double 1953. So you may wanna send it into ICCS. They may attribute this error, which could add a huge premium to the coin. But regardless, if you are a coin roll hunter and you find one of these that is beat up and worn, you can still get a nice little premium on the low end. And if you are an experienced collector that has one of these 1953 no shoulder folds in your collection, you may be able to add a massive premium to the coin if you get it reattributed by a different company like ICCS. In the year 1968, Canada underwent a significant change in the composition of its 10 cent coins, commonly known as dimes. The Minister of Finance at the time reported that due to a critical shortage of coins in Canada, he had authorized the minting of 75 million 10 cent coins in the United States. 
This decision was made because the Canadian Mint was fully stretched in addressing the shortage of quarters and was unable to meet the additional production requirements for 10 cent pieces. The difficult task of switching the composition from Canadian coinage from silver to nickel likely prompted the government to seek external assistance and the United States Mint was contracted to produce a substantial quantity of 10 cent coins. This move was only a temporary measure to alleviate the pressing need for circulating currency in Canada. One significant aspect of the 1968 Canadian dimes is the change in composition. Before 1968, Canadian dimes, along with some other denominations including quarters and half dollars, were primarily made of silver. However, as a cost-saving measure and due to the rising price of silver, the composition of Canadian dimes was switched from silver to nickel in the year 1968. This change also had a noticeable impact on the appearance and metal content of the coins. The switch to nickel composition for Canadian dimes in 1968 marked a broader trend in many countries moving away from silver coins due to economic considerations. The new composition provided a more cost-effective alternative while still maintaining the functionality of the coins in daily transactions. The decision to authorize the minting of these Canadian dimes in the United States and the shift in composition from silver to nickel in 1968 were driven by practical considerations and economic factors reflecting the changing landscape of currency production during that time. Now let's discuss how to identify and differentiate between the Ottawa and Philadelphia 1968 Canadian dimes. The reading on the side of a coin which consists of raised vertical edges is a distinct feature that can be used to identify and differentiate between coins minted in different facilities. In the case of the 1968 Canadian dimes, those struck at the Philadelphia Mint and Ottawa Mint can be distinguished by examining the characteristics of the reading. The dimes minted at the Philadelphia Mint, the reading will typically exhibit shorter notches that are spread farther apart. This means that the vertical ridges on the edge of the coin are shorter in length and the spaces between them are wider when compared to dimes struck at the Canadian Mint. Dimes struck at the Ottawa Mint feature larger notches in the reading and these notches are spread closer together. This results in longer and more closely spaced vertical ridges on the edge of the coin. The specific arrangement and length of the reading serve as a distinctive hallmark for coins produced at the Royal Canadian Mint. By examining the reading pattern, numismatists and collectors can identify the mint of origin for a given 1968 Canadian dime, distinguishing between those struck at the Philadelphia Mint and those minted in Ottawa. This level of detail adds an additional layer of nuance for individuals interested in the history and characteristics of coins from different mint facilities. An official statement was released by the Privy Council Office on August 21st, 1968. The Minister of Finance reported that he had authorized the minting of 75 million 10 cent coins in the United States. This was necessary to alleviate a critical shortage of coins in Canada. The Canadian Mint was fully extended in making up the shortage of quarters and could not meet the additional production requirements to provide an adequate quantity of 10 cent pieces. The cabinet noted the report of the Minister of Finance to the effect that he had authorized the minting of 75 million 10 cent pieces in the United States, and that is a quote from O.G. Stoner, Deputy Secretary to the Cabinet. O.G. Stoner, that is an interesting name. There are three separate mintage figures for the Canadian 1968 dimes. There's the Philadelphia, the Ottawa, and the Silver, which was only struck in the Ottawa facility. So first, there's 85,170,000 of the Philadelphia. There's 87,412,930 struck in Ottawa and 70,460,000 of the silver 1968 Canadian dimes. Some of the details and specifications for the 1968 Philadelphia. It is composed of 100% nickel. It has a weight of 2.07 grams, a diameter of 18.03 millimeters and a thickness of 1.16 millimeters. The coin was designed and engraved by Arnold Machen for the obverse and Emmanuel Hahn for the reverse. The edge is reeded, it is magnetic, and it has a die axis in metal alignment as is the standard for most Canadian, British, and Australian coins. Now, in terms of value, the 1968 Philadelphia Mint, if you can identify it, is actually a pretty interesting case because it is not as valuable on the low end as the Ottawa 1968 Canadian 10 cent coin. The silver, of course, you will get melt value for, so it is probably the most valuable. 
if you do happen to find one and it is beat up worn and been put through the meat grinder but if you want to get the maximum amount of money for a canadian 1968 dime you want to identify the philadelphia mint and hope for a high mint state example now if you can identify the philadelphia mint 1968 which will have shorter notches that are spread farther apart on the reading it can be worth all the way up to $425 for an MS66 example. I have actually found Canadian 1968 dimes composed of nickel that are in a high mint state. Maybe not MS67, but definitely pushing MS63 to MS65. So I don't doubt if you kept your eyes open, you can maybe find one of these, especially if you busted open a full uncirculated roll of 1968 Canadian dimes. I know there's got to be a few of them still out there, whether they're sitting in coin shops or maybe in the vaults of banks. So just to give you guys an idea in comparison, the 1968 that was struck at the Ottawa facility in Canada is worth around $61 for an MS66. So $425 for the Philadelphia and $61 for the Ottawa Mint. At the high end, it makes the Philadelphia Mint a lot more desirable and valuable and it's a pretty easy one to identify as well you just want to throw this under the microscope and inspect the reading mint made errors occur when coins are incorrectly produced at the mint facilities encompassing any issues arising until the minting process is finally completed these errors can stem from various factors such as equipment deterioration accidents malfunctions or even interventions by mint personnel. While coins undergo inspections during production to catch errors, some inadvertently find their way into circulation. However, modern production methods have reduced many errors, aided by automated counters effectively filtering out error coins. It is important to note that post-mint damage can sometimes resemble genuine mint errors, so it's definitely good to have an idea of what you want to look for to identify legitimate errors. Errors in Canadian coins can arise from various sources, including defective planchettes, faulty dies, or mistakes during striking. These errors may be classified according to the planchette, die, and striking system. Some errors may have multiple causes and might not fit neatly within a specific category. Labels used to categorize specific error types may describe the cause, appearance, or other factors contributing to the error. Examples include die cracks, rotated dies, clip planchettes, or missing elements. Some coin errors may even have multiple names or attributions adding to the complexity of its classification. However, uniqueness doesn't always necessarily dictate the rarity or value of an error coin. Usually, the farther back you go in a mint's history, the more prevalent errors will be, though modern minting practices have reduced their occurrence. Intentional interventions by mint personnel are rare but have happened in the past and typically involve actions intended to enhance the quality or value of a coin but may result in some of these unintended errors escaping. Planchette preparation errors are one of the most common sources of mint errors. The mint acquires long strips of metal that are punched to produce blank planchettes. Misfeeds or improper thickness can lead to issues like clipped planchettes or improper planchette thickness, resulting in underweight or overweight coins. Other common errors include lamination flaws, split planchettes, and cladding flaws, which affect the integrity or appearance of the outside of the coin. Hub and die errors can occur during the die making process or due to misalignment during use. Misaligned dies, multiple strikes, and off-center strikes can also occur during the striking process, leading to various air types. Edge and rim errors, such as wire rims or partial collars, can arise from collar mispositioning or deterioration. It's very important to note that post-mint damage can sometimes be mistaken for some of these mint errors, which highlights the importance of careful inspection and in numismatics. Canadian coins may exhibit a variety of mint errors stemming from issues at different stages of production, including planchette preparation, die making, and the striking of the coins. Understanding these errors and their characteristics is crucial for collectors and enthusiasts who wish to get the most out of their collection. The 1982 10 cent coin struck with a 1 cent die is classified as a mule but it is actually more of a planchette error and it is a remarkable mint error that occurred 
when a 10 cent coin was struck with dies intended for the 1982 pennies. Only a few examples of this coin are currently known to exist, which enhances its rarity and appeal among collectors. Identifying this rare error requires careful examination of both sides of the coin. On the obverse, the familiar image of Queen Elizabeth II should be present, but the size of her bust will be slightly different as it was intended to be used on the penny, and the size of the dime planchette is smaller. Also, the rim typically found on dimes should not be fully intact around the entire coin as some of that would have been flattened when it was struck with the larger penny die. Then when you flip over to the reverse, instead of the expected design representing the 10 cent denomination, which is the blue nose schooner, the image of the Canadian one cent maple leaves reverse will be visible. Now in all of the information I found about this piece, it is labeled as a mule, but as far as I can tell, it is actually more along the lines of a planchette error as both one cent dies were used on a planchette intended for the 10 cent coins. The origin of this error can be traced back to the minting process when a mix up or error occurred most likely at some point in 1982 when the pennies were being struck whether on purpose or accidentally some of the planchettes intended for the dimes got mixed into the bunch. It is also very possible in the case of errors like this that it could be intentional as only a few of them exist but regardless, it's always fascinating when the most simple of blunders or oversights can open up the coin heavens for some of these rare errors to come into existence. It's super important to note that not all of the silver looking one cent coins that you find are not going to be genuine mint errors. Many of these coins could have been dipped in tin or plated by individuals seeking to alter their appearance, which does not add any value to these pieces. But if you do find any coins and they have a super funky color, I definitely suggest checking out the specifications for that coin. If its weight is off or if the weight or specifications align with that of a different denomination that might indicate that you have a legitimate planchette error. Now some of the details and specifications for this coin, all of these specifications should be for the 1982 dime planchettes. So if you have a silver penny from the year 1982 and it aligns with all of these, then you most likely have a legitimate example of the coin that I'm discussing today. Now the overall mintage for the 1982 Canadian dimes is 93,960,898. They are composed of 100% nickel, they have a weight of 2.07 grams, a diameter of 18.03 millimeters, and a thickness of 1.16 millimeters. The edge of the coin is reeded, which will be one of the biggest giveaways that it was struck on the dime planchette. It should be magnetic as it was struck on a nickel planchette, and the die axis will be in metal alignment as is the standard for most Canadian, British, and Australian coins. Now when it comes to the value for this piece, one notable specimen, a PCGS graded MS62 owned by a gentleman by the name of Mike Byers, was obtained by a Canadian collector who found it in their everyday pocket change. Another example, which was graded MS64 by PCGS, fetched a substantial sum of $3,560, which sold in December of 2020. So just over $3,500 for a coin that is graded MS64, if you were to find one and has scored any higher around an MS65 to MS67, you could easily be talking a $5,000 to $10,000 coin. Unfortunately, usually when you find older pieces like this, they will not be in the greatest shape, but I can tell you from some of my penny hunts that I have found some super funky colored pennies. I have found some that are silver colored, some that are gold colored, and I still actually have them in my collection. And right after I am done making this video, I'm gonna go check some of the specifications just to make sure that I don't have any of these rare coins that I am discussing today. So this coin is classified as a specimen mule, meaning that it comes out of the 2010 wildlife specimen set. The inception of specimen finishes marked a turning point in the world of coin minting as it elevated the art form to new heights of sophistication and complexity. Each coin meticulously crafted with this finish serves as a testament to the ingenuity and skill of our artisans who meticulously execute every detail with precision and care. From the precisely machined matte lines that form the backdrop to the intricate relief elements brought to life with intricate detailing, each aspect of the specimen finish reflects a commitment to excellence and a dedication 
to pushing the boundaries of what is possible in coin design. In modern numismatics, specimen coins continue to captivate collectors with their unparalleled beauty and craftsmanship. While the original intent of the finish was to showcase technical capabilities, it has since become synonymous with elegance and refinements in coin design. Today, collectors eagerly anticipate the release of new specimen coins and sets, each offering a unique interpretation of the finish with varying degrees of frosting and texture. From classic designs to innovative motifs, specimen coins continue to inspire awe and admiration among numismatists and collectors worldwide, cementing their status as cherished treasures within any collection. The Canadian 2010 specimen dime presents a fascinating anomaly in the realm of numismatics, known as a reverse handsome mule. This unique variety can only be found within special specimen sets, specifically those containing the Lynx Kittens $2 coins. While these sets were originally intended to showcase the beauty of Canadian wildlife, some specimens deviated from the norm due to a production fault. At some point when the dimes for this set were being struck, instead of featuring the proper 2010 specimen finish obverse die, a 2010 circulation strike obverse die was inadvertently used during the minting process. This unexpected occurrence resulted in the striking of a small number of coins with a mismatched finish, earning them the moniker of reverse handsome mule coins. The combination of a circulation or business strike die on a proof or specimen coin adds an extra layer of intrigue and complexity, making them highly sought after by collectors seeking rare and unusual varieties. Identifying whether your coin is a mule is relatively straightforward. Simply inspect the background of the obverse side. If it exhibits a glossy finish instead of the expected matte finish seen on regular specimen coins, it is likely a mule. This distinct difference in surface texture serves as a telltale sign of the mule variety, distinguishing it from standard counterparts and adding to the allure among collectors. Now, as I mentioned, this is a specimen coin, so your best chance of being able to find one of these mules is gonna be pulling it out of the 2010 specimen set, but that doesn't say that you can't ever find one of these in the wild. Who knows if maybe there is another version of this where they accidentally struck some of the business strikes, with a specimen finish, so it is always good to have these dates on your radar so you know what to look for. I have found plenty of NIFC coins in some of my coin roll hunts in the past, including specimen and proof coins, and if you were to find a Canadian 10 cent specimen coin from the year 2010, it definitely doesn't hurt to flip it over the obverse and look for that glossy finish, which would indicate that it was struck with the business strike obverse die, and then you have an extremely rare coin. Now, there are some price evaluations for this piece. It is designated as an SP because it is a specimen coin. The lowest price valuation kicks in at an SP64 for $294. Coins graded SP64 are considered to be in choice uncirculated condition with minor imperfections. Despite these flaws, coins graded SP64 will still maintain strong eye appeal and overall attractiveness to collectors. Now the next valuation is for an SP65, which is $343. This coin is evaluated at $345 for an SP66, so you're not seeing huge price jumps for this coin as it does increase in the grading tiers, but still, this is one that not a lot of people know about, and it will definitely see some increase in value over time. Now, the maximum appraised value for this coin is $415 for an SP67. It is possible that it could score higher. A lot of modern Canadian coins can score higher than the 67 mark. It is very rare for older Canadian coins to score above either an MS67, a Proof 67, or a Specimen 67 but modern coins have a lot better of a chance, especially coins like Toonies, Loonies, and the Colored Quarters. I have definitely seen some higher graded examples of those. Now, $415 for an SP67. For Canadian coins, SP67 basically represents the pinnacle of preservation with virtually no visible imperfections, even under magnification. Finding coins in your pocket change with a high grade like this is very uncommon, but when you are pulling a Canadian specimen coin out of a set, they take a lot of care when they're striking the specimen coins at the Canadian Mint. There is definitely an extra level of care when the Canadian Mint produces specimen coins. They probably put them into the sets very carefully, and they probably have extra levels of quality assurance to make sure not too many flaws or errors get out there, even though there are some of these rare mules that have been accounted for. 
Now your best chance of being able to find the 2010 mule specimen dime is going to be to pull it out of a fresh 2010 specimen set. If you want to be able to get one of these sets, the best places to find them are probably your local coin shop. You could try eBay, maybe Kijiji or Facebook Marketplace. You definitely don't want to pay too much for the set, but unfortunately the coins in this set are facing reverse side out. So you will not really be able to scope out if it actually has this mule inside it. It will be a bit of a gamble, but if you are able to score one of these sets for a reasonable price, you may be able to turn a profit. Even if it doesn't have the mule specimen dime, it does have a unique tuning with a unique design and I know people definitely want this toonie for their collections so being able to buy one of these sets and finding this mule dime would just be a little cherry on top bonus. Now once again very quickly to be able to identify the 2010 specimen mule coin what you want to do is look at the reverse and it will have the typical specimen finish meaning it will be grainy and matte then you want to flip over to the obverse of the coin and it will be shiny and glossy which is typical of the business or circulation strikes. In the year 2021, to commemorate the 100th anniversary of the iconic Blue Nose ship, the Royal Canadian Mint introduced a redesign for the Canadian 10 cent coin, featuring a new artistic rendition by Nova Scotia marine artist Eve Beroub. In a groundbreaking move, the Mint also released Canada's first ever colored dimes, incorporating a touch of blue to vividly portray the essence of the blue nose. The inspiration for this redesign actually traces back to the year 1937, when the blue nose ship, symbolizing a cherished national emblem for Canada, influenced the original design of the 10 cent coin during the reimagining of Canada's circulating coins. Marie LeMay, president and CEO of the Royal Canadian Mint, expressed enthusiasm about this historic occasion, emphasizing the enduring legacy of the Blue Nose in Canadian history. The Blue Nose was launched in March 1921 from Lunenburg Harbour and quickly gained fame as the swiftest fishing schooner worldwide. Not only did it secure a record catch on the Grand Banks in its inaugural season, but it also brought the International Fisherman's Trophy to Nova Scotia. The Blue Nose maintained an undefeated status in racing for almost two decades, earning the title Queen of the North Atlantic Fishing Fleet. Its international representation included notable appearances at events such as the Chicago World's Fair in 1933 and His Majesty King George V's Silver Jubilee in 1935. Contrary to its name, the Blue Nose actually had a black and red hull with a yellow strip. The term Blue Nose had been a moniker for Nova Scotians since at least the year 1785. The coin's reverse was designed by Yves Baroub and showcases an angled view of the Blue Nose under a full sail and heeled to port on an open sea. This dynamic portrayal is available in both colored and uncolored versions both of which bear the double dated inscription 1921 to 2021. The colored version is groundbreaking for a 10 cent circulation coin featuring blue highlights that represent the deep waters of the North Atlantic. The obverse side features the effigy of Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II. Now, even though these commemorative design dimes from the year 2021 are incredibly revolutionary and beautiful, it is actually the single date plain design for the 2021 dime that you are looking for. Now, as I mentioned at the beginning of this video, there are actually four different designs for the 2021 dime. The first is the colored blue nose, then there is the uncolored commemorative blue nose design, then there is the double date, which will have the date of 1921 to 2021, and then there is the single date dime, which will only have the date of 2021, and that is the one that you want to look for. The mintage of a coin refers to the total number of copies produced and it plays a crucial role in determining a coin's rarity and potential value in the collector's market. In the context of the four different designs for Canadian dimes in the year 2021, the regular design with a single date has a much lower mintage compared to the other three designs, making it more valuable and rare for several different reasons. Distribution and Circulation the regular design of a coin is often the one intended for general circulation, and these coins are distributed widely for everyday transactions. Usually special or commemorative designs will be produced in smaller quantities and may not be as widely circulated, but in the case of the single date 2021, it is actually the opposite. Collector interest. Collectors often show a keen interest in special or limited edition coin designs, leading to a higher demand for these coins. 
Usually the regular designs, being more common and part of everyday transactions, might not attract the same level of collector attention initially. But this is actually something that adds to the intrigue and allure of this single day 2021 as because it does not stand apart from any other Canadian dime in terms of its design, they can easily slip under the radar of normal coin muggles, I guess we will call them. Now, when I say coin muggle, I am not trying to say it in a derogatory sense, but basically it is a term that I will use for anyone that doesn't have any knowledge of numismatics and they might actually let a coin that is worth a lot of money go in an everyday transaction. That's why it is always good to arm yourself with a little bit of knowledge. That way you don't accidentally let a coin into circulation that is worth hundreds or thousands of dollars by mistake. Minting decisions. Mintage decisions are made by the mint and they're based on factors such as public demand, commemorative events, and overall coin production requirements. Regular designs are typically minted in larger quantities to meet the demands of daily commerce, while special designs may have limited mintages. Now my best guess when it comes to the 2021 single date dime is that the Canadian Mint didn't actually have a really good plan in 2021 for how they were going to roll out the commemorative dimes. They may have actually struck some of the single date dimes at the beginning and then when they eventually planned or introduced the double date dimes with the date of 1921 to 2021, they may have actually switched up and produced a larger quantity of those. And because they had already made a decent amount of the single dates initially, they just released them into circulation and gave them out to banks. A similar situation would probably be with the 1991 quarters that have a very low mintage of around 450,000. Marketing and promotion. Special designs are often actively marketed and promoted by the mint, generating additional interest and demand. Regular designs may not receive the same level of promotional effort, which actually probably made the 2021 single date fly under the radar a little bit. Due to these factors and its lower mintage, coupled with the potential lower initial collector interest, can contribute to its rarity and consequently its increased value among collectors over time. However, the actual rarity and value will depend on the coin's condition and also the collector landscape for that particular year. Now, some of the details and specifications for the 2021 single date Canadian dime, if any of these are off, it may indicate that it is not an authentic example. It is composed of 92% steel, 5.5% copper, and 2.5% nickel. It has a weight of 1.75 grams, a diameter of 18.03 millimeters, and a thickness of 1.22 millimeters. The coin was designed and engraved by Susanna Blunt and Suzanne Taylor for the obverse and Emmanuel Hahn for the reverse. The edge is reeded, it is magnetic, and has a die axis and metal alignment, which is the standard for most Canadian, Australian, and British coins. Now in terms of value, this is not a coin that you're gonna get rich off of today. This is one that definitely has the potential to increase in value over time. And if you were to find one and it had any errors or anything special or notable about it, it may add to its value quite substantially. But it cannot be stated enough how rare these things are and how small your chances actually are of ever stumbling upon one of these in your pocket change. If you're a coin roll hunter, you might get lucky and find one of these every couple of boxes, but chances are you're gonna have to search and search if you wanna find one of these bad boys. Now in terms of value on the low end, it doesn't hold too much of a premium, but I would say you can probably get around a dollar for one of these, even if it's beat up, worn, and been put through the meat grinder. But the good news is it's a fairly recent dime, only two years old as I'm making this video. So chances are most of them are gonna be in pretty good shape at this point still. But if you were able to find one and it scores at the high end of the Sheldon scale, so that is an MS67, you can get around $100 for this right now. Now it is by far the most rare and valuable of all the different 2021 dimes that you can find and I have no doubt that in 10 or 20 years its value could easily increase tenfold. Enter the 2000p Canadian dime. Now this dime features the exquisite depiction of the iconic blue nose schooner on its reverse side. The blue nose is a symbol of Canadian maritime history, celebrated for its elegance and also its speed. The blue nose design was first introduced in the year 1937 and is still featured on the reverse of the 10 cent coins produced in Canada today. The blue nose design has become synonymous with Canadian identity and is beloved by collectors and Canadians alike. Its timeless beauty and significance make it a fitting tribute to the country's rich maritime heritage. 
Now, the reason that this particular dime holds such a special place in Canadian numismatic history as it was one of the first dimes the Royal Canadian Mint used the P Mint mark to denote production at the new facility in Winnipeg and also the composition change of Canadian coins. The introduction of the P Mint mark or composition mark on the 2000 P Canadian dime marked a significant milestone for the Royal Canadian Mint. It not only signified the growing role of the facility in Winnipeg, but also highlighted the shift in composition of Canadian coins. The new composition change for the Canadian coins involved transitioning from a primarily nickel-based alloy to a multiply plated steel core. This change was implemented to improve durability and reduce production costs. The inclusion of this P mint mark on the 2000 P Canadian dimes serves as a visual representation of these advancements in both production and composition. Now you might be wondering, what is the big deal? What is it that makes this coin so valuable? Well, it's not just about the value, but it's also about the excitement of the hunt and also the incredible stories they carry that make these coins incredibly special. But here's where it gets interesting. The 2000 P dimes aren't your ordinary coins. They were part of a fascinating experiment at the Canadian Mint. While the Canadian 2000 P nickels were released for circulation with a limited mintage of just under 5 million, the dimes and quarters with P mint marks or composition marks didn't make their debut officially for circulation until the year 2001. There was a test set issued by the mint in the year 1999 containing coins with the date 1999 and also P mint marks. However, no such set was released in the year 2000. So any 2000 P dimes or quarters that you come across with that P mint mark were either released by mistake or found their way into circulation through vending machine companies testing the new coins. The way that you can identify this 2000 P dime is to look for the P mint mark under the bust of Queen Elizabeth II on the obverse of the coin. The presence of this P mint mark on the 2000 dated Canadian dime adds to its rarity and collectability. It is only believed that a limited number of the 2000 P dimes were ever produced. It is unknown exactly how many of these made their way into the wilds of circulation, but it is estimated that no more than 250 of these holy grail coins were ever produced. Now this P mint mark indicates that the coin is made of multiply plated steel, which replaced the nickel and other compositions used before the year 2000. Now I'm sure you are all wondering about the value of this coin. Unlike the 1969 large date dime, which I have covered in a previous video, these 2000 P dimes are considered heirs. However, their scarcity and unique history make them a prized find for collectors. While these coins might not make you an instant millionaire, they can fetch you some pretty good money, especially if you were to find one of them in your pocket change. They are a true testament to Canada's ever evolving coinage journey. So the next time you come across a 2000 P Canadian dime in your change collection or coin roll hunting, remember it's not just a coin, it is also a piece of history. Now that we have discussed the story and how to identify this extremely rare coin, what do you say we get into some of the specifications and potential value if you were ever to discover one of these gems floating around in your pocket change or in one of your coin roll hunts. Some of the details and specifications for the Canadian 2000 P 10 cent coin. It is composed of multiply plated steel, which is 92% steel, 5.5% copper, and coated with 2.5% nickel. It has a weight of 1.75 grams, a diameter of 18.03 millimeters and a thickness of 1.22 millimeters. The artist who designed and engraved the coin, the obverse was designed and engraved by Dora de Pedri Hunt and Ago Aran, and the reverse was engraved and designed by Emmanuel Hahn. The edge of the coin is reeded, it is magnetic, and it has a die axis in metal alignment. So if you ever discover any of these, you definitely want to make sure that all of those specifications check out. You want to make sure the edge is readed, it is magnetic and has the correct weight and also thickness and diameter. Now, if you do identify all of those factors in terms of value, Coins in Canada does not actually list low end values, but I will give you guys the North Central Coins estimate. If you were able to find a 2000 P Canadian dime and it scores at the very bottom of the Sheldon scale, so that is around an AG3, I estimate you can probably get anywhere from $25 to $50 for it. Somebody will probably want it to fill out their collection. And even if you took it down to your local coin shop, they will probably pay a little bit of money for it. You might be able to get around $100 for a fine and up to $300 for an AU50. Now, when you start getting into the MS territory, you see some pretty big jumps in terms of value for this coin. It can be worth around $588 for an MS60. 
can be worth around 931 for an MS64. And this bad boy can be worth all the way up to $2,410 for an MS67 example. Now just to give you an idea in terms of value, the 2000 Canadian dime without a P mint mark is only worth around 25 cents for an MS60. And the maximum value that you could get for one of these is around 50 to maybe $75 if it scored an MS66 or MS67. So the 2000 P is far rarer than the 2000 Canadian dime without the P mint mark. And you can definitely make some good money off of one of these if you were able to score one. The 1936 Bar Canadian Dime stands as a highly coveted coin error, renowned for its significant value in the numismatic realm. This particular error is characterized by the presence of a distinctive bar or die crack that intricately joins the two bottom bows on the reverse side of the coin. Interestingly, despite the undeniable appeal and rarity of the 1936 bar dime, it's worth noting that the grading company ICCS currently does not officially recognize the bar variety for the 10 cent denomination. This actually adds an extra layer of exclusivity to these coins, making them even more sought after by collectors. For the 25 cent denomination, the criteria for acknowledging the bar variety by ICCS, they stipulate that the bar must be sufficiently strong and easily visible under five times magnification for it to be officially recognized and labeled as a bar on their holder. In the realm of coin collecting, nuances matter and the intricacies of the die crack play a crucial role in determining the coin's classification. There have actually been several recorded instances over the past decade where ICCS has refrained from designating certain 1936 bars as their proper designation. This decision often hinges on the perception of the die crack. Even if the crack is complete, ICCS may withhold the bar designation if the crack is exceptionally faint. These nuances underscore the meticulous nature of coin grading and the importance of understanding the specific criteria applied by certification services. As collectors seek to add these rare and distinctive 1936 bar Canadian dimes to their holdings, the delicate dance between visibility and completeness of the die crack adds an intriguing layer to the allure of these numismatic treasures. Now while the 1936 Canadian bar dime holds its own rarity and value in the realm of coin collecting, it does not quite reach the iconic status of the 1936 dot dime, which is considered one of the most coveted and valuable Canadian coins of all time. The 1936 dot dime is distinguished by the inclusion of a small dot placed below the date on the reverse side of the coin. In comparison, the 1936 bar dime with its die crack joining the two bottom bows on the reverse is indeed rare and sought after by collectors, but it does not carry the same historical and minting distinction as the 1936 dot dime. And while the 1936 bar dime may not command the same astronomical values as its dot counterpart, its scarcity and the intricacies of the die crack contribute to its appeal within the numismatic community. Collectors often find joy in assembling sets that include these distinct varieties, appreciating the uniqueness and historical context that each coin brings to their collection. Now, some of the details and specifications for this coin, if any of them are off, then it may indicate that it is not an authentic example. The mintage figure for the 1936 Canadian dime is 2,460,871, and the 1936 bar error is included in that mintage figure. It has a composition of 80% silver and 20% copper. It has a weight of 2.32 grams, a diameter of 18.03 millimeters. The coin was designed and engraved by Sir E. B. McKennell for the obverse and W. H. J. Blakemore for the reverse. The edge is reeded. It is non-magnetic and has a die axis and metal alignment as is the standard for most Canadian, Australian, and British coins. Now in terms of its value, this is a coin that does command a premium even on the low end, and this is definitely a good one that you can fish out of scrap silver purchases. That would be my best bet. If you want to find one of these nowadays, chances are you're probably not going to be pulling too many 1936s out of your coin roll hunts unless you get lucky and maybe get a collection dump. But the 1936 bar can be worth around $17.90 for a VG8 example. That isn't right at the bottom, but it is almost at the bottom of the grading scale. It can be worth around $123 for an AU50. 
and then as we start to get into the mint state region it can be worth around 221 for an ms60 and around 824 for an ms64 which is the highest graded listed example on coins in canada now just to give you an idea the 1936 without any errors is worth around 193 for an ms64 and then the 1936 bar is worth 824 so the regular 1936 actually has a higher listed price. It's worth around 1,420 for an MS67. So if you did ever find any of these and you managed to score that really high grade, you would easily be talking a 10 to $20,000 coin. The world of numismatics, particularly within the realm of Canadian coins, presents a captivating facet known as mule coins. The specialized category defines coins where an inadvertent yet intriguing deviation occurs during the minting process, specifically when an incorrect die is employed to strike either the obverse or reverse of the coin. These anomalies often emerge as exceptional and sought after specimens, adding a layer of fascination to the diver's tapestry of Canadian coinage. At the core of the definition of a mule coin lies the utilization of a mismatched die during the striking process. This departure from the intended die pairing results in the creation of coins that deviate from the standard designs. The interplay of the wrong dies introduces a distinct character to these coins, rendering them unique within the broader spectrum of Canadian numismatics. One notable example within the realm of Canadian mule coins involves the fusion of Newfoundland and Canadian coin elements. This fascinating convergence occurs when a Newfoundland coin is struck using a die for a Canadian coin or vice versa. The result is an amalgamation of design elements from both regions, creating coins that embody a unique blend of Canadian provincial heritage. Collectors and enthusiasts are drawn to mule coins due to their rarity, uniqueness, and the unexpected charm that arises from the unintentional combination of dyes. The identification of these coins often requires a keen eye as the merging of different designs may not be immediately apparent. Mules serve as a tangible artifact that showcase the intricacies and occasional errors and anomalies inherent in the coin minting process. For those that are intrigued by these mule coins, their acquisition becomes a pursuit of both historical and numismatic significance. These coins offer collectors not only a tangible link to the past, but also a testament to the variability in the coin production process. The convergence of design elements on a single coin serves as a testament to the rich history of Canadian coinage, where occasional errors and deviations from the norm result in coins that stand out as exceptionally rare and valuable pieces among collectors. Now, one coin that can be found within this remarkable numismatic landscape of mule coins is the 1870 Newfoundland Mule, with only two known specimens currently residing in the Bank of Canada Museum. This rare breed of coin possesses a unique element and features the obverse of the 10 cent Newfoundland coins and the reverse of the Canadian 10 cents. The intricacies of these mule coins adds a layer of fascination to their historical and collectible significance. Now this fascinating anomaly occurred in the production process of some Newfoundland 10 cent coins. It was during this phase that some of these coins were inadvertently struck using the reverse die for Canada's 10 cent coin. The result was the creation of these unique mule coins, which blend elements from different coin designs, bridging the gap between Newfoundland and Canada's numismatic heritage. For those that are eager to discern whether they possess one of these rare mule coins, there is a definitive criteria to identify them. The key lies in the inscription on the obverse, where if it reads Newfoundland coupled with the distinctive crossed maple bows with the crown design on the reverse of the coin, then it is classified as a mule. This straightforward method offers collectors a clear guideline for authenticating these extraordinary specimens within their own coin collections. The rarity and exclusivity of the 1870 10 cent mule coin is underscored by the fact that there are only two of these coins that are currently documented and are both safeguarded within the esteemed confines of the Bank of Canada Museum. Their presence within the museum's collection adds a layer of prestige to these numismatic treasures, further emphasizing their significance in the broader context of Canadian coinage. 
Now, some of the details and specifications for the 1871 Mule, if any of these are off, it may indicate that it is not an authentic example. Online marketplaces like Timu, AliExpress, and eBay are just absolutely littered with fake and counterfeit examples of Canadian coins. And this 1871 Mule would be an example that there could definitely be counterfeits out there floating around. So you definitely want to do your due diligence and make sure that all of these specs are on point if you do have one of these coins. Now, one unique thing about the 1871 Mule is it will have an H mint mark on both the obverse and reverse of the coin. The H mint mark on the obverse will be located under the bust of Queen Victoria and on the reverse, it will be located under the bow. This indicates that the coin was struck at the Heaton Mint in Birmingham and that is most likely where this error occurred. Now, the mintage figure for the 1871 that was not struck at the Heaton Mint is 800,000. The mintage figure for the 1871 H Mint Mark or Heaton Mint is 1,870,000. But technically, this mule coin was actually struck on a Newfoundland 10 cent coin and it was accidentally paired with the Canadian reverse. So technically, it is not included in the Canadian mintage figure. It would be included in the Newfoundland mintage figure. Now, some of the details and specifications for the Canadian 1871 dime it is composed of 92.5% silver and 7.5% copper or sterling silver as it is more commonly known. It has a weight of 2.33 grams, a diameter of 18.03 millimeters. The coin was designed and engraved by Leonard C. Wyan for the obverse and reverse. The edge is reeded. It is non-magnetic and it has a die axis and coin alignment, which is usually the standard for American coins. Now, when it comes to values, I could not actually find any values or priced estimates on any websites or in any coin guides. But if I had to give an estimate for this coin, I would say that you could get anywhere around $5,000 if it's at the very bottom of the Sheldon scale. So even if it is beat up, worn, and been put through the meat grinder, if you can identify the wording for Newfoundland on the obverse, and then it has the Canadian reverse, then you have yourself an incredibly rare coin. It might be one of the rarest Canadian 10 cent coins of all time, or Newfoundland, whatever you want to classify this as. In terms of its high end value, I don't doubt if it's scored in the high MS range, you could easily get $100,000 for this coin. Chances are, if you did find one at this point, it would be pretty beat up and worn, and it is not going to be in a mint state but never say never, crazier things have happened. Maybe one fell behind one of the presses. However, it is that these incredibly rare and valuable Holy Grail coins make their way from the mint out into circulation or into people's collections is not entirely known, but it does happen. And it is always good to have an idea of what to look for so you don't accidentally let a coin that is worth a fortune go back into the wilds of circulation or you just sell it for its silver melt value. Now in conclusion, the tale of the 1870 10 cent mule coin unfolds a captivating chapter in the narrative of Canadian coins, where both the fusion of Newfoundland and Canada's numismatic elements create a distinct and rare category. These mule coins represent not only a tangible piece of history, but also an opportunity to engage with the fascinating intricacies of coin production and the occasional errors that result in the creation of these exceptional and highly sought after numismatic specimens. Now, let's briefly discuss pattern or trial coins. Most pattern essays or trial coins were not officially approved for release, but produced to evaluate a proposed coin design, a new or revised coinage, or to test the metal composition, dies, or structure of a new coin. And when it comes to pattern trial and essay coins, usually there will only be a few known examples of the piece, if any, and they usually don't leave the mint facility unless intended, and they are quickly snatched up graded and accounted for. I don't want to say that there's a 0% chance that you will ever stumble across one of these in the wild, but if you were, it would definitely be a gift from the coin gods. The thing that makes this coin great, as opposed to some other errors and varieties, is how easy it would be to identify. Silver coins are non-magnetic and nickel coins will stick to a magnet. The thing that makes this 1967 mackerel trial piece so special is that it is actually composed of nickel instead of all the other mackerel dimes which were made of silver that year. This is most likely the result of experimentation by the Canadian Mint to test nickel planchettes or maybe they planned on releasing some of the commemorative coins in nickel as well but regardless it's another great legendary coin to have on your radar. If you do ever happen to have a 1967 mackerel dime that appears like it may not be silver or has a more dull tone all you have to do is hit it with a magnet and if it sticks 
you have one of the rarest Canadian dimes in existence. Another identifying factor that makes this coin different from its silver counterparts is its weight. This nickel planchette pattern will weigh 2.1 grams and the silver mackerels should weigh 2.33 grams. There are actually a few other similar cases of coins where the Canadian mint will experiment and these holy grail pieces are born. One other good example would be the 1967 Bobcat Quarter, which is pretty much the exact same case as this dime. It was a pattern or trial piece struck on a nickel planchette, and it can be worth some really good money as well. Some of the details and specifications for this coin, the overall mintage for the 1967 mackerel dime is 32,309,135. The trial pattern piece is composed of 99% nickel. It has a weight of 2.1 grams, a diameter of 18.03 millimeters. It is magnetic. The face value is 10 cents and it is in metal alignment as is the standard for most Canadian coins. Now that we've discussed some of the history and how to identify this coin, what do you say we get into the value of this extremely rare piece of Canadian numismatic history? If you were to ever send this coin in to be graded, it would be classified as a specimen and get an SP designation as that is the designation most Canadian pattern or trial coins will receive. So as I mentioned earlier on, there are only a few known examples currently for this coin. If you were to find one and it scored an SP63, it would be worth around $3,000. It can be worth around $4,000 for an SP64. And this bad boy can be worth all the way up to $5,000 for an SP65, which as far as I can tell is the highest graded known example currently. If you were to ever find one and it scored any higher, you would probably see some pretty big price jumps. And I would not doubt that the price of this coin starts to double. And if it hits around an SP67, it could easily be worth anywhere from $15 to $20,000. So even though there is not too many of these known to exist, and very few of them probably left the mint facility, it is definitely still a good one to have on your radar. I have found 1967 Mackerel Dimes coin roll hunting and in my pocket change before. They are still out there in the wild, and you can definitely fish them out if you keep your eyes open. So first, let's give you guys some information so you have some context on how this coin came into existence. In the year 1967, the rising price of silver forced a reduction in the silver content in Canadian 10 and 25 cent coins from 80% to 50% composition, although some coins were still minted in 80% during that year. 1967 and 1968 are considered transitional years for the amount of silver commonly used in Canadian coins and the composition was eventually changed to pure nickel in the year 1968 with around a third of the dimes and quarters being composed of 50% silver for that final year. The transition from silver to nickel composition in Canadian coins during the years 1967 and 1968 was a significant change in the country's currency. The shift marked a move towards a more cost-effective and durable material for coin production. This ultimately impacted the value and collectability of these coins for numismatists. This was a very experimental and tumultuous time at the Canadian Mint and there was also a very heavy workload as the full run of 1967 commemorative coins was no doubt a huge undertaking in the years prior and working during this time must have been a strain on Mint employees. To help relieve some of this pressure, some of the Canadian 10 cent coins produced in the year 1968 were actually struck at the Philadelphia Mint in the United States. These are distinguishable from the Canadian dimes by looking at the width of the grooves along the outside reading of the coin. The dimes struck in the United States will have wider and more squared notches and the Canadian dimes will be more narrow and angled. The Philadelphia dimes are considered to be the more rare of the two varieties, but neither the silver nor nickel 1968 dimes are exceptionally valuable. However, in the year 1969, a production mishap occurred during the creation of the Canadian dimes resulting in an error in the matrices. By mistake, a portion of the coins produced had the large date feature instead of the intended small date. Since multiple coins are struck simultaneously by various machines, a mixture of both large date and small date coins emerged. Presently, there are around 20 confirmed instances of these error coins, but it is believed that there are still around 20 to 30 out in circulation that remain undiscovered. 
To identify this coin, you have to look at the date on the reverse of the coin. I will show an example of what both the small and large dates look like. But what I highly suggest is that if you find a Canadian dime from the year 1968, hold on to it because the date on the 1968 dime was only struck in the large size and the size of the numerals was reduced the following year, or at least so we thought. So if you compare the size of the date on your 1969 dime and the size looks similar to the date on the 1968, then you may have yourself a holy grail coin. The examples of this coin that have been discovered are usually not in the greatest condition and at best are barely pushing mint state. If you're ever to find a legitimate example of one of these and it's scored higher in the MS range, it could easily be one of the most valuable Canadian coins of all time. Though there are only few known examples, it is very rare that an actual estimate exists for the amount of holy grail coins that could still be found floating around in the wilds of circulation. And this is one where if you hunt dimes regularly, you can definitely validate the lack of other good stuff to look for. So now that we've given you some information on how this coin came into existence and how to identify it, what do you say we discuss the specifications and potential value? The specifications of the 1969 large date dime should be exactly the same as the 1969 small date, except for the size of the numerals on the date. It is composed of 100% nickel. It has a weight of 2.07 grams, a diameter of 18.03 millimeters, a thickness of 1.16 millimeters. The obverse was designed by Arnold Mockin and Myron Cook. The reverse was designed by Emmanuel Hahn and Myron Cook. The edge of the coin is reeded, it is magnetic, and the die axis is in metal alignment, as is the standard for most Canadian coins. So let's get into the values for the 1969 large date dime. First, just to give you an idea in comparison, the highest graded known example of the 1969 currently is an AU50, which is just before the MS mark. As I mentioned earlier, if you were to find one of these and it did score anywhere in the mid MS range, this would be an incredibly rare and valuable Canadian dime that could easily be worth hundreds of thousands of dollars. And one of the best things about this 1969 large date dime is it is not actually that old. I have found 1970 nickels, dimes, quarters, that are in a high mid state. So your chance of being able to find one of these and it's in decent condition aren't the worst ever. Hopefully someone didn't find one of these and bash it with a hammer not knowing what it is. But you never know to find one of these even at the absolute bottom of the Sheldon scale would be a nice little treat. So just to give you guys an idea of value, the 1969 small date can be worth up to 20 cents for an AU50, which is two times its face value. It can be worth a couple dollars when it starts to hit the MS region. It can be worth 10, 20 dollars when it starts to hit around an MS 65. Now, when it comes to the 1969 large date, on the very bottom end of the Sheldon scale, it is worth $11,300 for an F12. So that is not the absolute bottom. The absolute bottom of the Sheldon scale is an about good or a good, which is a three or four out of the 70 point system. But an F12 is still pretty low, not the greatest shape ever, that is for sure. And you're still getting over $10,000 for this dime. Now on the high end, one of the highest graded known examples is an AU50 and it can be worth around $21,000 $200 for an AU50 example. And as I mentioned earlier on, it is estimated that somewhere around 20 or 30 of these are still floating around in the wilds of circulation. So I suggest that you guys, if you have your piggy bags, you go bust it open, look through your dimes, because if you were to find one of these and it has been through the meat grinder, you can still make over $10,000. So definitely a good one to have on your radar and to keep your eyes out for, whether you're sifting through your pocket change or you are coin roll hunting. What do you guys think about the 1969 large date dime? How many do you think are still out there? And what would you ever do if you found a legitimate example or if you have ever found any coins similar to the one discussed in this video, let me know down in the comments. Also, I would really appreciate if you guys would smash that thumbs up, subscribe if you're new, and also hit that bell notification so you can stay up to date with my new content as it is being released. But I think that is pretty much gonna do it for this one, folks. So until the next one, everybody, peace out and have a good one, y'all.